This is the lecture for Lab 6 on Cellular Transport. If you remember from the previous lab, all cells must have a plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane is the structure that surrounds the outside of all cells and also the organelles. The purpose of the plasma membrane is to serve as a barrier to separate the environment from the inside of the cell. And plasma membranes are selectively permeable. Permeable means that some molecules can cross the membrane going into the cell and other molecules can leave the cell and go out to the environment. It is selectively permeable because not all molecules can cross the membrane. Only certain types of molecules are able to cross the membrane. Membranes are composed mainly of a phospholipid bilayer. And a phospholipid, of course, belongs to the group of lipids in terms of macromolecules. The basic structure of one phospholipid is that it has a hydrophilic head with two hydrophobic tails. So this is an example of one phospholipid. And this yellow ball here is the hydrophilic head which interacts with water on the outside of the cell, and then two hydrophobic tails. So those are two fatty acid chains that are hydrophobic. So this is one part of the bilayer. This is the second part of the bilayer. So bilayer, by bi meaning two. So one layer of phospholipids here and the second layer of phospholipids there. This is the structure that is selectively permeable. Only small molecules and nonpolar molecules can pass directly through this phospholipid bilayer. And the phospholipid bilayer is providing the main structural framework for the cell membrane. In addition to the phospholipid bilayer, there are many other components that are embedded in the membrane. One large group of molecules are proteins. And if you remember from the macromolecules lab, proteins have many different functions in the cell. But one of the most common functions in the membrane is to help with the transport of certain substances that are too large to cross through the phospholipid bilayer. And one example is a channel protein. The channel protein allows large molecules to cross through the bilayer. So it acts as sort of a tunnel to allow the large molecules to get into the cell. Another molecule that you find embedded in the cell membrane is cholesterol. And cholesterol serves as a membrane stabilizer. So here's the cholesterol over here, and it helps to stabilize the shape of the membrane. And this is especially important in animal cells. Last type of molecule that I wanna mention are carbohydrates. So these would be sugar molecules, and they're involved in self-recognition. So this is how cells can identify cells that belong to the individual or foreign cells. And carbohydrates, they're composed of sugars. Glyco refers to sugar, so glycoproteins are used on identification, and also glycolipids. So a glycolipid is a sugar bound to a lipid molecule. Brownian motion is an important concept for cell transport, especially for passive transport, like diffusion. And Brownian motion explains the fact that molecules are always moving. And if you remember, molecules are composed of atoms. And in an atom, you have protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And what do you have spinning around the nucleus? You have electrons spinning around the nucleus. So these electrons that are spinning very fast around the nucleus, it causes the whole atom to jiggle a little bit. An example would be like a top. So when you're spinning a top, if it's spinning really fast, so if the top is spinning really fast, it looks almost as if it's standing still, but it moves a little bit. So it doesn't stay on one little spot. It will move around a little bit. And often the movement of atoms, and like a top, it's very random. 
So you'll have an atom that will start in one place, and because of that little jiggle it has due to the electrons spinning around the nuclei, that atom will move in a random uh, pattern. And large molecules are going to move more slowly because they have more mass, and small molecules will move faster. So this Brownian motion describes the motion of molecules in a liquid or in a gas. And it's basically the random motion of molecules. One example of transport is passive transport. And the most basic type of passive transport is simple diffusion. So with simple diffusion, no energy is required. The molecules are just moving because of Brownian motion. Another characteristic of passive transport is that the movement of the molecules is going to go from the area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So always the movement is from the area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And this movement will occur until you reach equilibrium. When you reach equilibrium, that means you no longer have a concentration gradient. It means the molecules have an equal concentration throughout the whole system. This is an example of simple diffusion. So in this case, you have a beaker full of water and you put a drop of food coloring into the water. And in terms of the food coloring molecules, this is the area of high concentration. So those molecules are going to move due to Brownian motion to spread out into the beaker, which is the area of low concentration. And you can see diffusion occurring because here's that drop, it's fallen to the bottom. The molecules are starting to move out and eventually you reach equilibrium where you no longer have a concentration gradient. So the color of the food coloring in the water, it's all even. Now, when you get to the point of equilibrium, the molecules are still moving, but because you no longer have a concentration gradient, you do not have diffusion. Simple diffusion can occur across a cell membrane. So if this yellow line here represents the cell membrane, and if you have molecules that are small enough to diffuse directly across the cell membrane, then eventually those molecules will move from the area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So over time, these molecules will start to randomly diffuse across the membrane until you reach equilibrium, where the concentration on both sides of the membrane is equal. When you reach equilibrium, you no longer have diffusion because you don't have a concentration gradient anymore. But some of the molecules will move out of the cell, some will move into the cell, so that Brownian motion never stops. Active transport is another type of cell transport, and it's basically the opposite of passive transport. The first difference is that energy is required. And it, energy is required for this process, and it's easy to remember that because this is active. If you're being very active, you're using a lot of energy. So for active transport to occur, the cell has to use energy for this process, and the energy is usually in the form of ATP. Second difference is that the movement of molecules is going from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. And this is not a natural type of movement. That's why energy has to be put into this. So when the cell is moving things from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration, you are going to increase the concentration gradient. You are actually going to build up a high concentration of the molecule on one side of the membrane. This is a diagram of active transport. So here's the cell, this is the phospholipid bilayer, and for this you need to have a transport molecule. So that's some sort of protein that is embedded in the phospholipid membrane. So outside of the cell is a lower concentration of the molecule. Inside the cell is a higher 
concentration of the molecule. So in order to actively transport this molecule into the cell, the cell has to use ATP because this is not a natural passive type of movement. And what you end up doing is creating an area of high concentration and an area of low concentration. So that's a concentration gradient. And because of that, active transport never results in equilibrium. It's more like you're sort of stockpiling molecules on one side of the membrane. Osmosis is a very important type of transport for living things. And the basic definition of osmosis is the diffusion of water across the cell membrane. And this is a really important definition for three reasons. It is referring to diffusion, so that's passive transport. So everything that is true about passive transport, simple diffusion, is true about osmosis. Second important thing about this definition is it refers to water molecules only. So you're only talking about water molecules when you're referring to osmosis. And the last thing that is important about this definition is it's referring to the cell membrane. So for osmosis to occur, you have to have a cell membrane. So osmosis, the diffusion of water across the cell membrane. So you're basically tracking if water is going into a cell or going out of a cell. With osmosis, we are concerned mainly about solutions. And a solution is a mixture of two or more substances. The first substance is called a solvent. And the solvent is the dissolving agent. And in biology, it's really, really easy because the solvent is always water. In chemistry, the solvent can be something else like alcohol, but in biology, the solvent is always water. So whenever you hear the term solvent in terms of biology, it means water. The second component in a solution is the solute. And the solute are the dissolved materials that you find in the water. And that can be many different types of things. It can be gases, it can be nutrients, it can be waste products, it can be sugar. And a solution is always expressed as a percentage. So if you have a solution that is 5% sodium chloride, and sodium chloride is salt, then it must be 95% water. So when you express something as a percentage, that means the total number is 100%. So if you, if you are given the percentage of the solute, you can figure out the percentage of the water. You just take that number and subtract it from 100. When talking about osmosis, there are three important terms we use, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. And the important thing about these terms is that they are comparison terms. So it's like saying stronger or faster or smarter. So these terms are comparison terms. And in osmosis problems, what you are comparing are two solutions to each other. So again, these terms are used when you compare two solutions to each other. So an example or an analogy could be the height of people. When you compare the height of people, you can refer to someone as being taller or shorter. So when you compare Draymond Green to Kevin Durant, Draymond Green is shorter than Kevin Durant. So that's a comparison. But then if you compare Draymond Green to Stephen Curry, Draymond Green is taller than Stephen Curry. So that's what I mean by comparisons. And in terms of osmosis problems, what you are comparing are the cytoplasm compared to the environment. So the cytoplasm of the cell, that is a solution inside the cell and you're comparing it to the solution outside of the cell.
Now I want to go through those three terms in more detail. So I'll start with isotonic. And to remember the meaning of the words, it's good to go through their roots. Iso means equal and tonic means solute. So solute, remember, the, that is, refers to the substances that are dissolved in the water. And iso means equal. So it means the solutions have the same amount of solute. So isotonic solutions are when the two solutions, remember this is a comparative term, when those two solutions have equal concentrations of solute. So if they have equal concentrations of solute, then they have equal concentrations of water. So if one solution is 10% sodium chloride, then the second solution will also have 10% of solute. So when you have isotonic solutions, then there will be no osmosis. The reason you have no osmosis is there is no area that has a higher concentration of water. So water will still cross the membrane, but you won't get a net gain or a net loss of water. And when you have isotonic solutions, that means you are in equilibrium. Again, because there's no concentration gradient, there's no net gain or loss of water across the membrane. So here are two examples of an animal cell and a plant cell in an isotonic solution. So that means this solution, the environment, has the same concentration of water and same con concentration of solute compared to the animal cell and compared to the plant cell. So water can, molecules can still go in and still go out, but because you don't have a concentration gradient, you won't get a net gain or loss of water in the cell. And the same for the plant. So water molecules can move in and water molecules can move out. If the two solutions that you are comparing to each other are not the same, do not have the same concentration of solute and the same concentration of water, then one of those solutions must be hypotonic and the other one must be hypertonic. So like comparing height, if the two people are not the same height, then one must be taller and one must be shorter. So a hypotonic solution. Hypo means less, like hypothermia means that a person's body temperature is lower than normal. And tonic, of course, means the solute. And again, solute, that, that is the substance that's dissolved in the water. So the hypotonic solution is one with the lower concentration of solute. And if it has the lower concentration of solute, that means it must have the higher concentration of water. So now you have a concentration gradient. You have one solution that has a higher concentration of water than the other solution. So in this situation, you will get osmosis and the water is going to move out of the hypotonic solution to the hypertonic solution, which I'll talk about in a minute. And this is an example of putting cells in a hypotonic solution. So in this case, the solution, the environment is hypotonic, which means that inside the cell, it must be hypertonic. So the hypotonic solution is one with the lower concentration of solute, which means it has higher concentration of water. So this out in the environment is where you have the higher concentration of water. So it's going to move into the cell. And if enough water keeps moving into the cell, then the animal cell is going to rupture. For plant cells, it's a little bit different. You have a lot of water moving into the plant cell because the plant cell is hypertonic compared to the environment, but the plant cell will not rupture because the plant cell has that rigid cell wall, which will prevent the membrane from rupturing. So again, if the two solutions are not isotonic to each other, if they're not the same concentration, then one has to be hypotonic and one has to be hypertonic. 
So I went through the hypotonic solution, now the hypertonic solution. So hyper means higher. If you have a kid that is hyperactive, that means that kid's activity level is higher than normal. So the hypertonic solution has higher solute concentration. So if it has the higher solute concentration, higher concentration of solute, then it has the lower concentration of water compared to the hypotonic. And when you have this situation, you will get osmosis because water is going to move from the hypotonic solution to the hypertonic solution. So water moves to the hypertonic solution. And this is an example of cells being put in a hypertonic solution. So in this case, the environment has the lower concentration of water so that means the higher concentration of water is inside the cell, so the water is going to move out of the cell, and if enough water leaves the cell, the cell will plasmalize. So it will dehydrate, it will lose water. And the same thing will happen to the plant cell, so this is the rigid cell wall. If you put a plant cell into a hypertonic solution, water will leave the cell and the cell will lose water. And you can see the cell membrane will pull in. Now for a practice problem. A cell that is filled with a 5% sodium chloride solution is put into distilled water. What will happen to the cell? So for these examples, we are often referring to a beaker. I'm gonna make it big so I can draw on it. So a beaker filled of a solution and the beaker solution, I'll just refer to it as solution A. And inside that beaker, you put a cell. So I'll make it a big cell. And that cell is filled with the solution, and that is solution B. So this is an osmosis solution. So you are comparing solution A and solution B to figure out the direction of osmosis. So for this, you need to figure out first the percentages of solute and solvent for each solution. So often in the problem, it will give you information. The cell is filled with a 5% sodium chloride solution. So the cell is 5% sodium chloride. 5% sodium chloride. So if it's 5% sodium chloride, then it's going to be 95% water. Because remember, a solution is a percentage. So that's the cell. So you figured out the percentage in the cell. Now the solution it's put into, it's put into distilled water. And distilled water is essentially 100% water. So if this is 100% H2O, then it's basically 0% sodium chloride. All right, so figuring out the two solutions. First, are they equal to each other? Do they have the same percentage of sodium chloride? 0% compared to 5%, they are not the same. So these two solutions are not isotonic. So if they are not isotonic to each other, then one has to be hypotonic and one has to be hypertonic. And remember hypotonic, hypo means below. The hypotonic solution has the lower concentration of solute. So you have zero solute, 5% solute. solute. Zero is lower than five, so this is the hypotonic solution. So the hypotonic solution. And just to double check, remember the hypertonic solution, hyperactive kid, high activity level, the hypertonic solution has the higher concentration of solute. So five is higher than zero. So this is the hypertonic. solution, hypertonic solution. 
Now also you have a concentration gradient. So you have a difference in concentration of water. Outside of the cell, it's 100%. Inside the cell, it's 95%. And remember, osmosis is the diffusion of water across a membrane. So diffusion, diffusion goes from the area of high concentration to the area of low concentration. And for osmosis, we're talking about water. So the diffusion of water is going to go from the highest concentration to the lower concentration. So water is going to move into the cell. And that's what I told you before, is that osmosis always goes from the hypotonic solution to the hypertonic solution. So water is going to move into the cell. And if that happens enough, and this is a red blood cell with no cell wall, the cell can rupture. A second practice problem, a cell that is filled with a 5% sodium chloride solution is put into a 10% sugar solution. What will happen to the cell? So again, you can draw the situation. So here is your beaker filled with a solution, and this will be solution A. You're putting a cell into it, so here is your cell, and it represents the cytoplasm solution B. So what is the information? The cell is filled with a 5% sodium chloride solution. So this is 5% sodium chloride. And if it's 5% sodium chloride, then it must be 95% water. And now the environment, the beaker solution, is a 10% sugar solution. So this is 10% sugar. And if it's 10% sugar, that means it's 90% water. All right, so now you need to determine if these solutions are isotonic, hypotonic, hypertonic. So, and for this, the solute, it doesn't matter if it is the same thing. So it doesn't matter if it's both sodium chloride or sodium chloride and sugar, compared to sugar. All right, so isotonic. Isotonic means that the two solutions have the same concentration of solute. So this one has 10, this one has 5. They are not the same. So therefore, one of these solutions must be hypotonic, the other one must be hypertonic. So hypotonic solution has the lower concentration of solute. Five is lower than 10, so this is the hypotonic solution. So that's the hypotonic solution. And just to double check, the hypertonic solution, hyperactive kid, higher level of activity, hypertonic solution has the higher concentration of solute. 10 is higher than five. So the beaker solution, the environment, is the hypertonic solution. And to double check, the hypotonic solution has the higher concentration of water. Hypertonic solutions have the lower concentration of water. So now you will get osmosis because you have a concentration gradient. You have a difference in concentration between the two solutions. So water moves from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. So the movement of water is going to be out of the cell. So water is going to move from the area of higher concentration across the membrane to the area of lower concentration. And again, osmosis moves from the hypotonic solution to the hypertonic solution. The last practice problem is a little bit different. This one states, when a cell is placed in a sugar solution, it gains water. Explain what happened. So for this example, you just draw the situation. There's your beaker with the solution, and that is solution A, the environment. 
Here is your cell inside the beaker and the cytoplasm is solution B. And the information you have is that when the cell is placed in the sugar solution, so solution A has some amount of sugar in it, it, the cell, gains water. So what do you know about this? Is that water is moving into the cell. So you have osmosis occurring, water is crossing the membrane, and it's moving into the cell. So that must mean that the two solutions, solution A and B, are not isotonic. Because if they were isotonic, you would not have a net gain of water, which is what the situation tells you is happening. So since those two solutions cannot be isotonic to each other, one must be hypertonic and one must be hypotonic. So all you can determine is which solution is which. And remember, water moves from hypotonic solutions to hypertonic solutions. So that must mean that solution A is hypotonic and solution B, the cell, is hypertonic. So solution A must have a lower concentration of solute compared to solution B. Solution B would have the higher concentration of solute. So conversely, solution A would have the higher concentration of water. And solution B would have the lower concentration of water. And of course, through this example, you can't tell the exact concentrations of each solution, but you can figure out the situation and you can figure out the direction of osmosis.